So this is what we label standard strategy. I copied them here before we started. And the, <clears throat> as an explanation for the reasoning behind the steps, it really does um, go to the very last step. The step number four, what we say apply Newton's second law or writing the net force equation. That is the goal, end goal of following these standard strategy steps. The reason we don't start out with step number four is if we were to give you a physical situation and tell you to write down this equation, then most of us will get stuck. Um, it, um, so let me use the lab, um, lab situation as an example. So this is the physical setup that you will be working with for the lab tomorrow. You have a table or track with a pulley at the end, and you have a mass, or in your case, actually a cart, so that it rolls mostly frictionlessly, that's attached by a string to a hanging mass. And the key question that analysis of this setup is getting at is what is the acceleration? And conveniently, that also is exactly what Newton's second law equation is getting at. Given the forces, what is the acceleration that is caused by that force? But if we were to if we, we were to simply give you this situation and ask you to write down Newton's second law, then it, uh, it's hard to see where you would start. So you can write down F net is equal to MA, but how does this relate to the things that are actually in the question? how does this mass relate to <laughs> these other two masses that are in the, in the description of the scenario? So even though this fourth step is our eventual goal, to start from here or to kind of state that as your goal and to try to do that just uh, without any guiding steps is, um, I, I can't imagine someone doing that just the first day in physics class. That is why we don't start out with step number four. We give you steps one, two, and three. So that at each step of the way, you will have some guidance. So that each chunk of the problem solving it is in a, in a, in, in um, bite-sized pieces that you can comfortably chew. So um, with this example, I'll just uh, uh, do the first step here. And um, yeah, I'll just do the first step here. So we have you start out with drawing a free body diagram. And um, this is actually the most important step as you will hear me say in a few <laughs> different videos. It, um, this is the step where you uh, stop, slow down, look at the situation carefully, think through it, think of all the forces that are acting on the object and um, make sure if there, was a, if there was any unclear thinking before that you are not influenced by them. So we start out with the advice that you draw one for each object. So we draw one for this mess here, and we draw one for this mess here. I usually don't draw the free body diagram right on top of my other uh, figures that illustrate the setup, um, but you can do it either way. I've seen it done either way. So this uh, hanging mess is a little bit easier to um, clearly draw free body diagram for, so let me do that first. So you consider all the forces that are acting on this mass here. Then um, this is presumably on Earth. So there's always going to be gravity. So you draw gravity. And as you visualize this setup, I hope you realize that this top string here represents another applied force on this mass. 
So I have to draw that a representation of that force and I'm going to call that tension force. And each time you draw a free body diagram or rather you think you have finished the drawing of free body diagram, it's a good practice to pause and reflect on the diagram and um, think if, uh, is, that, um, is that the correct diagram? Um, in the sense, did I draw any forces that don't belong there? Usually you should think about what's exerting that force. Uh, with gravity, it's being exerted by the earth. With the tension force, it's being exerted by the string. If you can identify an object which is exerting that force, um, you may have made a mistake, so it's uh, good to carefully think through it. And the second is if you have drawn all the forces that should be there. And one of the things I like to check is if the direction of acceleration I must have from the diagram makes sense. Um, so here, uh, the direction of acceleration looks like it should be downward or possibly upward, but up or down, not left or right. And imagining this scenario in my head, that seems to make sense. So, uh, so this is the correct free body diagram. Um, with the cart, I guess if you simply uh, look at this string, top string here and draw the tension force, I guess that's not wrong. Um, that's actually the most inter interesting force in this setup. But um, as you become more practiced in drawing free body diagram, I hope you will also learn to recognize that there's gravity and normal force acting on this card. So when you draw these free body diagrams, um, and I, this is the part that takes really the most uh, uh, most of your creativity, most of thought, most of your effort. <laughs> um, so, um, so once you have done that, once you have done it correctly, then the remainder of the steps, including steps two and three, are quite a bit uh, mechanical. It, uh, um, it, it uh, kind of set, um, um, fixed the set of steps which you can learn to do and um, and it's uh, something you can almost uh, start to do automatically. It's the very first step, drawing the free body diagram, where I hope you, ne you are never doing that automatically. You are always stopping yourself and uh, giving yourself uh, enough time to think through it to make sure you're not making any mistakes. So, um, so once you, so drawing free body diagram itself will take some practice. And once you do that, then you have these uh, steps laid out, step number two, step number three. And by the time you get to step number four, really all you have to do is uh, read off information that's already in the diagram. And I'm hoping you will uh, get to see that as you're working on homework sets that are due, um, I guess, tonight and <laughs> will be due uh, uh, next one week from this Monday. So let me uh, give you a bit of a comparison between how we give you these uh, four steps and, no, let me do it this way. How we give you these four steps and how the textbook and the portable TA lays it out. Uh, let me bring over the textbook from my other window. So this is the uh, set of steps that are in your textbook. So your textbook doesn't give you really a single reference for Newton's law strategy, um, but uh, let me just uh, link up those, um, those things that are both in the textbook and um, in what we give you so that it doesn't look like, so that it, you can see the connections. So, um, Sorry, I'm moving my Zoom controls. <laughs> you can see that in the video, but I, anyways. So in your textbook, uh, what we lay out as a standard strategy is broken out in two sections. One is in chapter five, 5.7, 5 drawing free body diagrams. And in chapter five, uh, there are some questions where you could use detailed um, force problem solving strategy, but, um, much of that has been reserved for chapter six, applications of Newton's laws. So in that organization of the textbook, uh, 
um, the whole layout of this strategy kind of gets broken up into two pieces, which I think is a little bit unfortunate. So the first part <laughs> is in section 5.7 and it's uh, in problem solving strategy, constructing or drawing for body diagrams. So um, this is what your textbook says. And let me just uh, throw the comparison. Um, so in your textbook, it tells you, draw the object under consideration. It says it does not have to be artistic. And um, so uh, we take it, as, uh, take it to an extreme. And it does say, if you are treating the object as a particle, represent the object as a point. And that's what you are seeing us do so far in this class. Um, as in, we are, we are using these dots to represent the entire object, regardless of its size and shape. And uh, later on in the semester, especially after we've introduced the rotation, after exam two, uh, we will start to draw more extended bodies as our um, <laughs> object when, you're, when we are drawing free body diagram. But for now, most of the time, you'll be drawing a single dot. Um, or I'll be drawing a single dot. And uh, step number two here says, include all the forces that um, act on, oops. include all the forces that act on the object, representing these forces as vectors. So, so these are, um, those are the arrows that I was drawing on the free body diagram. And these two steps that are outlined here correspond to our step number one, drawing free body diagram. And um, it's kind of a difficult to describe all the things that should be going on um, in, um, in, in, fix in, uh, in writing. So that's why you have a few videos, including the videos from last week that illustrate drawing process for free body, um, the process for drawing free body diagram. Um, and what we give you as a step number two, choosing a, um, or it might look like in your textbook, there is no step number two. This is something that um, we are kind of pulling out from a step that is given in the textbook. So the textbook says, convert the free body diagram into a more detailed diagram showing the X and Y components, which corresponds to our step number three, break down forces into their components. Now, here's a, something that the textbook presumes that you have, X, and Y components. You can't really talk about components until you have the axis. Um, now, if you're de always dealing with a straight axis, then it might, it's obvious what the X and Y directions are. But very commonly, especially in this class, you will have situations where it's more convenient to use axes that are tilted. That's why break that's uh, the reason we break out step number two, so that we are encouraging you to give some thought to how you choose your X and Y axis. And really what matters here is, as Ben points out in this video, is the direction of the acceleration. And this advice is looking forward to step number four, where you are writing the Newton's second law equation and this vector equation really represents uh, multiple equations, or one for the X component, one for the Y component. And we kind of recognize or realize that our equations are going to look simpler if we can set one of these equal to zero. And we do that in step number two by choosing our coordinate axis very carefully. Um, you don't have to, I guess. Uh, you can always choose straight axis and um, it's still doable, but in many cases, you can be creating more work for yourself that you didn't have to create. <laughs> so, um, 
So that's uh, step number three. And um, I guess what they are telling you in this step number four, if there are two or more objects, draw a separate free body diagram for each object. That feels like that's something you should have right at the beginning when you are actually drawing the free body diagram. Um, but anyways, so we just put them in the right order so that you start, you start thinking about drawing the um, free body diagram for each object from the very first step instead of checking to see if you did it wrong after you've done it. Um, so, so the one step that your textbook leaves out is the step number four. And, and that's a kind of a consequence of how the textbook breaks out these uh, problem solving strategy into two sections, one in chapter five and one in chapter six. So in chapter six, they give you what they call problem solving strategy, applying Newton's laws of motion. And some of the, um, some of the steps that they are laying out here is a bit duplicative because the, these first three steps here, this is a drawing free body diagram as they already covered in section 5.7. So really the only new thing that they are introducing here is what they are saying, apply Newton's second law to solve the problem. And our application of Newton's second law is writing down this equation. And the idea is that if you have followed these steps, which is, I guess, kind of, well, it doesn't match number for number, but it is our steps one through three. If you have done that, then all the information you need to write down Newton's second law for equation for each object, it should already all be in the diagram. All you are doing is this step now is simply reading off the information. And you've seen some examples of that already, hopefully. <laughs> and in this uh, virtual class session, I will um, give you maybe a couple more examples of me doing that live. Um, so, so yeah, so that's how it uh, matches up with um, matches up with the um, textbook strategy. Now there is something we kind of omit in standard strategy, in particular. So um, in your textbook, it says if necessary, apply appropriate kinematic equations from the chapter on motion along a straight line, and it says something about the check the solution to see whether it's reasonable. And all that's good. Um, I don't include them as part of standard strategy because I guess what I want to impress on you is that this doesn't actually solve the problem for you. It sets you up to solve the problem <laughs> because once you have written down Newton's second law equations, then what you will have, uh, what you have left is is a system of equations on which you can do the algebra to try to solve for the, um, solve for the unknowns. And um, sometimes, depending on the problem, you might have to bring in additional information like the kinematics e equations to, um, to have enough number of equations for the number of unknowns you have and, um, and solve that. So, Really, there's a step number five, which is actually solving the problem. <laughs> but um, once you get to step number four and you have system of uh, equations, then most of you know how to go from there and solve your system of the equations to actually get a result. And checking to see whether solution is reasonable, that's a habit you should be building and we'll be illustrating that um, plenty of times throughout this semester. Um, Okay, so that's it, how it matches up with the, the textbook. Uh, let me show you the example from the portable TA to show you how it matches up with what you will see in portable TA. Um, I kind of noticed this as I was um, uh, writing up the think pair share activity for this week. And um, so when you look at the question for think pair share activity this week, which is uh, chapter 
uh, actually question nine to um, at least one of them is it'll um, say let me reiterate the strategy introduced in question eight six so let's go back to question eight six and look at what the strategy introduced is <laughs> um, hopefully i'm actually hoping that you have been reading through the portable ta as you are working through homework questions so that you have actually seen it but if you haven't now um, as you are doing the think pair share activity it's the time to look at it so this is question a6 and it actually deals with a situation that's quite a bit similar to um, the question that you are dealing with in your lab uh, with a, a bit of a special modification in that uh, the theta is equal to zero for the situation in the lab but otherwise it's dealing with the two blocks um, connected by string so it's quite similar so, um, so as it says this is a classic multi-block problem and in the answer Andrew LB introduces um, what he calls multi-block strategy this is um, this is what he introduces. He says, um, draw a free body diagram for each mass individually. So what it calls so um, so what it calls step number one here that matches up with our step number one draw a free body diagram individually for each object. <laughs> and then if you just look, read the stem number two, it, um, it kind of looks like he skipped right up to stem number four here. And our purpose for providing steps number two and three is to give you the guidance um, how to go from a free body diagram to writing the Newton's second law equation. Um, and as you read through what Andrew L.B. wrote in the portable TA, you can see how they do match up. Oops. So um, I, I feel like ours is a slightly polished up version of the strategy that he describes in the portable TA. Uh, is there no? <laughs> Try to find the zoom that'll work. All right. Um, so, so as you might have noticed uh, when I drew free body diagram here, after you're done drawing free body diagram, um, if you're immediately trying to write down Newton's second law, especially in the component form, you're skipping a bit of a step here. Um, what's, your x what's your x direction? What's your y direction? Um, and in his instructions too, Andrew uh, says to, um, so, hmm, I guess in this strategy, he's giving you something that's a bit of a one dimensional thing because he wants you to write Newton's second law along the direction of motion. So he's imagining defining one axis, x-axis, along the direction of, of motion of the mass. So we do that explicitly. It, it, we set up for that explicitly in step number two by identifying the direction of acceleration and using that to choose a coordinate system. And, um, and yeah, using, and the, the coordinate system is chosen for each object separately, as you see him do here uh, with these objects. So the mass on the ramp is accelerating this way, possibly. So uh, that's the x-axis. Um, the hanging mass is accelerating down, possibly. So that's chosen as the x-axis. Um, and in order to write down this Newton's second law along those directions, you need to, uh, so when forces are either along that direction or perpendicular to it, right? You have no additional work to do, but sometimes you will have some forces that are not 
in one or the other direction, but kind of diagonally. It's a combination of both the directions. That's where you do need to break it down into components so that, uh, so that you can see which direction of forces is perpendicular to the direction of motion and which direction is parallel to the direction of motion. So, um, so in step number two, he says quite a bit here, and that's broken down explicitly in our steps number two and three. And just one additional thing, he calls it a multi-block strategy. But if you have a single block, um, it's not multi-block, but you can use the exact same strategy. Um, I guess the difference might be that uh, a lot of you might feel like with many single object uh, situations that you have enough intuition to uh, get to the answer without going this, through this complicated strategy. And for many of you, that might be true. And if you are saying, all right, I just want to skip right to the answer. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but what I want to caution you with is there are some questions where um, your intuition will fail you. You won't know quite what the next step to do is. And uh, that's where this standard strategy really shines because uh, this is the detailed systematic set of steps where you are able to follow from one step to next and it, once again, each bite-sized the chunk so that you can chew each piece without too much difficulty. So. Um, let me show you some examples of questions where um, I'm hoping if you are trying to approach that intuitively, it'll stump you. But if you break it out the way um, we lay it out for you, then you'll be able to uh, work through the setup. 